Right. So um, I guess we're kind of coming to the end of the chemistry section and moving into the manipulation and then over into the biology section, right? So um, <laughs> biology, biology, that nasty stuff. So uh, Andrew and I are leaving soon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. So, um, but one, so there's kind of one last real topic that I, I wanted to talk about um, this morning. And then uh, this evening, we wanted to go back and readdress some of the issues um, that we talked about yesterday in terms of which parameter para pairs and, and um, what we thought I'd, we'd do is fill out the tables a little more that Alex started uh, to look at uh, the various aspects of the different things that you can measure and, and let's finish up that discussion. So, because I, I think most of us felt that that really didn't get finished. So we're going to work on that tonight. But um, for right now, uh, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about autonomous sensors because pretty much everything we've been discussing up to this point has been um, from discrete, taking discrete samples. You have seen a little bit uh, of the underway PCO2 systems, but even those, um, you know, basically there's someone that's there to take care of those. Now, now think, take your experiences over the last few days of, of all the methods that you've seen now and the care and intricacies of making those measurements and say, okay, now I would like to do those measurements from 2,000 miles away uh, on a platform that's this big, that's bouncing around in the ocean, getting hit by hurricanes, uh, lots of that nasty biology stuff growing all over. Um, <laughs> and I need it to work for a year without ever touching it. That's a real challenge. Um, so as you move from laboratory-based approaches through underway type measurements where you're no longer in the laboratory, but at least you're in a moving laboratory where you've got power and you've got people standing right there. I mean, you can't run to Kmart to go buy some whatever, zip ties or whatever, but you know, at least you're not too bad. Then on to the autonomous instruments, that those, those are quantum leaps in difficulty of making the measurements. And um, so I just wanted to take you through an example of one of those systems, so just so you can kind of see how we do it as, as an example of um, what, what's involved in trying to do that. But, but before I get into that too much, um, what I wanted to do first was to introduce you to um, this website, the IOCCP website. It's, it's www.ioccp.org, which stands for the International Ocean Carbon Coordination Project. This is a, a group that um, operates through the IOC office, the United Nations in Paris. And in particular, uh, what I wanted to bring your attention to, if you go on the left here, you see all the different things that we do. But in particular, if you click on the sensors page, one of the things that we do is we try to maintain an inventory of commercially available carbon sensors. So as you've been hearing about all these great things that um, you can do, if you really want to know, all right, now I'm ready to buy a total CO2 system, dissolved inorganic carbon, what, what really is out there? Um, this perhaps is not a perfect list, and I welcome anyone that knows of other things that are available to please let me know, and we will include it in the website. But to our knowledge, these are the, these are the instruments that are commercially available. So. Um, so for example, here are the, the dissolved inorganic carbon. There's a couple different versions of the Vinda. Uh, there's the Apollo. Here are the commercial alkalinity sensors. There's a Japanese one. There's also the Vinta 
that does the alkalinity. Um, PCO2 sensors. This Battelle one is the one that I'm going to be showing you today, but there you'll see there's also a Proceanus. The General Oceanics is the one I think you saw in Alex's lab as an underway PCO2 system. Uh, there's the Sammy's. Carioca is a, is a, a drifting buoy that it's, the whole system is built into a uh, small, but small to me, but big to most people, uh, drifter that you can just throw in the ocean and it drifts along and does measurements. Uh, anyway, you can see that there's quite a few. So I, I encourage you to go look through here, pH, particulate carbon, and that's it. And again, if you s know of things that are not in here, please let me know, and we will try and update that, and we try and keep this as current as possible. So that's a bit of a resource for you. Is, is there any plan to have information for people about the advantages, disadvantages, and relative costs of these various systems on your website? <coughs> uh, well, they all have links that take you to the, manufacturer. the manufacturer's opinions, advantages, advantages and, <laughs> um, and costs for those that feel their cost is reasonable and those that don't, you have to call them and say, what does this really cost? Uh, no, that's uh, a little too politically charged. There, that, that information is more or less in some various reports that have been out uh, that have come out, but uh, also the cost would be different in the several countries, so right? And they change over time, and yeah, so we we try and stay away from that. So w what I'd like to do is talk to you a little bit about uh, one particular instrument. Again, not trying to sell my instrument, but just as an example of the kinds of things that can be done and and are being done uh, out there. So this is a moored. CO2, PCO2 analyzer that we put onto buoys. Um, it was originally a design that was originally developed by uh, Francisco Chavez and Gernot Friedrich in Edinburgh. And they, um, they developed in the mid 1990s, they came up with this e equilibrator design that I'll show you. <coughs> and used a LICOR infrared sensor. And the idea there was um, the problem, one problem with being away from uh, the lab is it's, it can be difficult to calibrate the instruments, but all instruments have drift. So what they did was they kind of got around that a little bit by uh, the, so the old, the LICORs, the 6252s, have two cells. They have a reference cell and a, and a sample cell. And what they did was they ran air, marine air, through the, the reference cell, and they ran equilibrated water through the sample cell. So what they measured what directly was the delta PCO2, the air-water difference in PCO2. Now the advantage of that is that any instrumental drift or problems with the instrument presumably would affect both of them almost the same, not exactly, but uh, almost the same, so that hopefully the delta is a more robust measurement than the absolute values. The downside of that, of course, is what we really would like in many cases are the absolute values. So then <coughs> Lycor came out with a uh, a new CO2 sensor, this Lycor 820, the gas hound, which uh, does absolute measurements, is significantly cheaper, and um, <coughs> we adapted that so that uh, we would do absolute measurements of water and air. So the system that we've got now uh, is, um, it's LICOR, it's based on this LICOR 820, which is a, a single cell uh, infrared detector. We do measurements of the air and the water, so these are now absolute measurements. And one piece of that that we added, because now you no longer have that advantage of the dual cells that, that vary together, is that we, we added a, a calibration gas to the system so that we can calibrate 
Uh, we built it in a way so that it's got this modular design so that it can be put into different designs of mooring. It's, it's essentially designed as an autonomous package so that all I need is a platform. And at the moment, I've got systems on 12 completely different buoy designs. So these are, these are the tau buoys, the buoys that there are 70 of them across the equatorial Pacific for monitoring El Nino. Um, we've got a number of CO2 systems there. This is a, just another example. These are the coastal uh, NDBC weather buoys. Uh, and our systems are, are on those. So it's, it's a, meant to be an independent package. The electronics look something like this. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it because um, you're going to see one for real upstairs where you can actually uh, poke at it and say, hey, what's that? Um, but it's, it's basically a LICOR. There are some boards here that control the uh, switching of valves. There's a valve block that's here. You see it on both sides that switches uh, to sample from one air stream or another air stream that we'll talk about. Um, this, this is a modem. This is an old picture of an old design. The, the system is designed to transmit the data back in near real time, back to the laboratory, so we can see how it's doing. And, it, and we use the Iridium satellites. So this was the Iridium modem. Um, but what we found is um, by putting the modem here, which is a convenient place to put it, you end up basically with a, a coax cable that goes up to the antenna that has to be, of course, on the top of the buoy. And those cables, we found, are very fragile. So instead, now what we do is we've taken the modem out of here, and the modem is actually mounted directly with the antenna on the tower so that we just talk to the, that whole transmission package through a serial cable, which is much more robust. And so there's lots of little things in there that um, little tricks that we've learned over the years in doing this that make it much more robust. Um, the equilibrator is kind of the, the key to this, and it's a, an interesting, unique design. This is where uh, Jernot and Francisco really get the credit. And um, the idea, so the, the equilibrator basically looks like a, a lowercase h, right? And um, it's open at the bottom, so this would stick through the bottom of the buoy if, if there were a buoy here. And the, the air, so off, off the chart here would be that electronics package that I just showed you. The air comes out of the LICOR through this inner tube, red tube, and in eventually comes out below the water line in this equilibrator. The bubbles then rise up. As they're rising up, they're equilibrating with the, the CO2 in the bubble with the CO2 in the water. The bubbles then break into a headspace, and the air outside then travels back up through, out, through the, around the outside of that inner tube back to the LICOR where it gets measured. And so this is a closed loop. So this is, this is an example of, we, we heard the other day about the different types of equilibrators. This is a bubble type equilibrator. So the equilibration, rather than, you'll see actually upstairs, you'll see Chris's, Chris Langdon's showerhead design of, of uh, under, for his underway CO2 system that's similar to what Alec had in his lab where you're spraying uh, droplets of water to increase the surface area and, and promote exchange. This, this is kind of the opposite. You're increasing the surface area by having the air in bubbles that have lots of surface area for the exchange. Now, the original Imbari design had this as a, a fixed equilibrator. Oh, oh, sorry, sorry yeah. There's no air stone at the bottom of this. There's, there's no air stone, and this is just a Teflon tube. Um, we found that the air stones uh, biofoul very quickly, and it changes everything. And we get sufficient equilibration just with the small diameter uh, Teflon tubing. And, and with the nice Teflon tubing, nothing sticks to it, so it seems to work 
fairly well. The other neat thing that the, the real uh, key to this equilibrator is that these rising bubbles, in addition to equilibrating the CO2, they also push the water up. And what they do is they push the water up and over the flat part of the H and out this other tube. So the rising bubbles actually create a circulation through, so it pulls in water from below, passes it out through this, this shoulder and out. It, it's, it's the same idea as the under gravel filter on an aquarium, right? When you, on an aquarium, you put your, your, your air stone into a little chamber that pushes the water up and out, and that's what's sucking the water through the gravel on the bottom of your tank. It's the same idea. And that way we can circulate water uh, without having a water pump and without using the power. Because the big thing on a buoy, aside from not being able to stand there and tweak dials, is that power is very important. You have to have everything be as low power as possible. Uh, and this, so this kind of performs two functions at once. The other neat thing with, with all of this is this uh, equilibrator is made out of copper. Actually, it's a copper nickel alloy. We, we originally, the original design uh, was made out of pure copper. And what we found was we'd put them in the equatorial Pacific, you know, and they would be, uh, say, 30 centimeters long. When we got them back, they were 15. That, that, that the copper uh, goes away, it, it corrodes, it uh, disintegrates. Um, <clears throat> anyway, the other thing that we found because as I mentioned, the original design had this as a fixed, uh, a fixed thing, which is fine as long as you know the exact water line of your buoy. But typically, we don't necessarily know the water line of the buoy. It depends on what other packages are put on there. And, and like I say, now that we're on 12 different designs of buoys, a lot of these buoys I, I have never even seen. So one of the modifications we made that you'll see upstairs is that the uh, equilibrator is now housed in a, a piece of foam. This, so this orange box here represents a, a piece of syntactic foam that uh, the equilibrator is embedded in that. And we changed the, the upper part of this so that it's now a coiled tube. And this whole thing now sits in a hole in the buoy. And, and this part actually rides up and down, so that way I don't have to know, I don't have to worry about exactly where I place the equilibrator. It's self-regulating. It controls itself by, by floating. And, and that's important because, as you can imagine, if you put this equilibrator too high, and it really only takes an inch or so too high, it can no longer lift the water up and over if, that, if the water line, if the water line were down here. It couldn't lift the water up and over, so then you get no circulation and you're going to get a bad measurement. So uh, that's why that's important. Um, oh, and here's just a picture of the, of the uh, original design sticking out of the buoy. We, we've changed it too. It used to be that the two tubes, the original design, had them the same length. We found that by shortening them, this what we actually do now is this you'll see in the piece in the one upstairs that the, this part of it is actually much shorter. That way we don't worry about bringing them together, but also it significantly reduces the weight that we have to float for here. So again, just another little. So this, this is what the package looks like in a, in a buoy. In this case, it's the Tau buoy. There's three cylinders. Uh, I've only brought one cylinder with me for this, and that's the main electronics uh, component. There's also typically a battery compartment, and what we've found is that 138 D cell alkaline batteries uh, is enough to run this whole system for 400 days. And that includes the trans, actually, it's designed for a nominal length of 400 days. I, I've actually had them run for almost uh, two years. On the, on the D cell batteries. And it, th this kind of works out to about uh, 60 pounds of batteries. So it's, it's not light, but it's, it is doable that we frequently uh, end up 
if, if they're not retrieving the whole buoy, a lot of times we'll just go on the buoy, unstrap the batteries, pull them out, stick in a new one, and plug it in and go. The other tube you see here is a gas cylinder. Um, you've probably all seen the A-size regular aluminum cylinders for, for storing gas. What we use is, is a shorter version of that. It's, it's about the same diameter, but it's only about this tall. It, it kind of looks like a scuba tank. But that holds, again, enough gas to, um, to run the system for almost two years. Um, we, we, try and, we typically try and run them for a year. Um, we, well, we routinely run them for a year. They, they have been gone a little bit longer uh, in an emergency. Uh, and so the third tube is the, is the electronics, and then this is the equilibrator sticking out of the top of the buoy. The way we run it um, is, <coughs> so another, if you recall from your, your PCO2 uh, structures, there, there instructions, there's, uh, it, PCO2 of course is a function of temperature and pressure. So this, this system is designed for a very specific purpose. It only does measurements in the surface waters. Because of the equilibrator and the, the design, you're not going to put this thing on the bottom of the ocean. It, it, it only works up in the surface. So the pressure is, is not too much of an issue, although we do measure the pressure in the LICOR. The temperature, the way we get around the temperature, the underway systems control temperature, right? So the uh, detector has a thermoelectric cooler that cools the detector down, makes it very stable, because the detector is very sensitive to temperature. But that takes a tremendous amount of power. You can't afford that power on a buoy. So we turn that off. We turn off the temperature control in the LICOR. Instead, what I do, or to get around that, is basically every time we turn on the sensor, it gets recalibrated at whatever temperature it's at. That way, I don't really care what the temperature is. If it's calibrated at that temperature, then uh, then we're okay. So we'll, this is the sequence whenever we turn on the system, so it's, it sits dormant, it turns itself off basically until uh, it's time to take a measurement. Routinely, uh, most of my systems, every three hours we, we take a measurement. We just found through experience that that's generally pretty good for catching a diurnal signal uh, if there is one. In some places there's quite a substantial one that I'll show you. Anyway, so we turn the system on. First, it does a zero calibration, and we do that with chemicals. So you just have a closed loop of air that runs through a soda lime trap that pulls out all the CO2, and we, uh, we give it a zero calibration point. It then switches and does a span that's drawing air from, the, from a calibrated tank. We, use, uh, we always use WMO primary reference standards are traceable to the primary reference standards. So these are calibrated by the NOAA lab, the Ezra lab in NOAA in Boulder to uh, a hundredth of a, of a part per million. And we, so we measure the span, that gives us uh, a high value and in wh what we found is that uh, with the LICOR, um, they're pretty good if as long as your measurement is somewhere between your two calibration points. It's pretty good at interpolating. It's not so good at extrapolating. <laughs> so if you're going to be measuring, if your waters you think are going to be five or 600 ppm CO2, then you better have a 600 or a 650 ppm standard, not a 400, because you're gonna have errors. Uh, anyway, so we do a zero and a span. Now it's calibrated. Then we run the equilibrator. Uh, bubble equilibrators are not quite as efficient, at least in the uh, style that we've got as, as the shower heads. So they've got a relatively slow response. We, um, the, the time it takes to actually get to equilibrium, of course, depends on how far away you are from equilibrium when you start. 
Um, but we found that for oceanographic type changes in, in, um, that 10 minutes, a 10 minute equilibration time is, is more than sufficient. And so we just went on the safe side and went with a full 10 minute equilibration. So it's sitting here running now in a, in a loop through the equilibrator, through the LICOR, in the pump, back to the equilibrator and in that loop. And then once we do the equilibrator measurement, then we do an air measurement and then it turns itself back off. That whole process takes uh, right about 20 minutes in, in the configuration we've got it now. So that's rough, about as quickly as we can do a measurement. We can do, we can, if we want to, we can do three measurements an hour in following this sequence where it's done, it starts again, it recalibrates. Because of course, as long as the whole time you've got the LICOR on, it's, it's warming up a little bit. So so we have to recalibrate every time. Um, we've had a number of opportunities to evaluate the, uh, if not the accuracy, at least the consistency of our moored CO2 measurements with systems that we believe give us uh, sufficiently accurate measurements or what we believe to be good measurements. We had an opportunity to do this recently in Japan. In March, we went. They've got this uh, really lovely saltwater pool that was used to, they, they actually designed it to monitor how fish evade nets. So they built this giant pool and they stock it full of fish and then they drag their fishing nets through it and, and there's cameras, there are windows actually all around here and they would have cameras on every angle so they can see what the fish do to avoid the net. And anyway, so we, we, there were no fish in it at this time, but uh, it was full of seawater and uh, we were manipulating the, the PCO2 up and down. We had, uh, I think, five or six underway PCO2 instruments and there were another uh, About one. Five. Yeah, about five buoy systems, something like that. Yeah, you can't really see. Mine's, mine's right here with the equilibrator. Right, there's a SAMI right there. And there's, yeah, there's a SAMI right there. The intake for, so here's my equilibrator. The intake for the underway systems was right here. So we tried to get it all. There was also a, a very strong circulating pump. Um, and so here's, here's the preliminary results from that, the, the dark blue diamonds are from the Nice uh, underway system that for this, for the purposes of this exercise was considered to be the, the best, the, the, the most accurate, or at least the closest to, I don't know how to say it, but it was, we think it was the most accurate. And, and so our, our system is the pink one you can see, uh, so the first day we had the CO2 at about 280 or 280 and change and we were about one, one ppm high. We then the second day increased it up to 435 or so and we were basically uh, right on. So each one of these levels is, is one ppm. And then the third day was not quite as good. You can see here's the the, um, the standard system and we were again about one, one ppm higher. But what this, this kind of illustrates is, I mean in general, this, this was cons these, were, these were all state of the art instruments run in relatively ideal conditions. You know, inside a building in a giant swimming pool that common calibration gases, common calibration gases you know, everything was as good as it could get and yet we still had, uh, you know, at times ranges that were on the order of five to seven ppm. And, and to make it even more confusing, you know, this, this was uh, one SAMI system and this was another SAMI system. So even the same instrument uh, that measures CO2 exactly the same way right next to each other still showed some variability. So it's, it's a tough measurement to make. But, you know, you look at the, could you, 
would you know otherwise that this is correct and that's not correct? I mean, that's the problem with CO2 measurements. It's a fairly easy measurement to make. It's very easy to get a number, but you have no way of knowing. You cannot intuitively say that's a good number or that's a bad number. The second Sammy, oh yeah, it was, I don't know what happened to it. I think they just, yeah, it means it was not on this picture, but it was another one. Right, <laughs> it's off scale perhaps. Yeah, the Sammy did not do great, but. One of the difficulties with this pool is that because of all the fish, and I mean the wood, the, the seawater arrives by truck, it's put in the pool, circulated through a sand bed regularly. And so there's a significant organic decomposition and organic component in this water. And the suggestion was that the Sammy was having some trouble with fouling problems that were not showing up in the fast flow through water equilibration. Right. Okay, so now I just wanted to show you. So I, I've got uh, currently, uh, either 21 or 22 of these systems out in the ocean right now routinely making long-term measurements. And so I just thought I'd show you a, a few uh, just as examples. Um, so this, this, this particular one is from Station Papa. I, just, I did these last night after coming back from the kids, so hopefully, <laughs> hopefully they're okay. But uh, so these, these are the these are the CO2 values as of yesterday, since I, I did it last night. So th this is from PAPA. The light blue here is the uh, surface water CO2, and the dark one is the uh, atmospheric. And, and actually, in this case, um, this is where they swapped out the buoy. So this was on a system that's been out for a year. They just, they just had their uh, fall cruise. They went out, they pulled out one buoy and put in a new buoy. Typically, we just completely swap buoys and CO2 systems. So, uh, you know, I don't know, did it, did it really change? Or at least the air seems to agree pretty well from, those are two completely independent systems that um, this is at the end of a year cycle and this is the beginning of the next year cycle. Uh, so that's, so you see CO2 in the water is lower than the air. Uh, at Papa, this is in the Gulf of Alaska. All right, so next we're gonna go over to the other side of the ocean. We're gonna go and now look at this, this is the Kyo site. This is a, in the Kuroshio extension off of Japan. Uh, also, as of yesterday, also see that CO2 is uh, lower than the air and actually it's been, so this, these plots are all showing the last month, the last 30 days actually. Um, so CO2 has been coming down uh, with some other kind of interesting signals in there. Um, and then in the third, let's take a look at, now we're going to look at uh, the Hawaii Ocean, the W. Hotz mooring. This is at the Hawaii Ocean time series site. And again, up to yesterday, you notice that at Papa and at Keo, the CO2 was lower than the atmosphere. In the middle of the subtropical gyre, it's actually higher than the, you also notice that it's much more stable at the, in the subtropical gyre than with the exception of some of these little events here. But uh, anyway, thought that was interesting that, that it's higher. Uh, so yeah, so again, you can see lower, lower, higher. Well, well, that that's actually one of the nice things about um, doing the atmospheric CO2 measurements. So the the atmosphere, at least out in these open ocean sites, is generally pretty pretty uh, stable. So where I would and and there's a whole lot of diagnostic information that we get back from these that I'm not showing you that allow us to evaluate. And I haven't, these are just, you know, 
pulled off straight off the web. These are the totally raw data that have not been looked at at all. But where I see a peak in the atmospheric value that correlates with a peak in the water, that's suspicious. But where we see what seem to be good uh, atmospheric values, now it doesn't necessarily mean that the equilibrator reading is right, but that at least tells me that I think the light core seems to be functioning properly and it's not some crazy calibration or something. Um, yeah, but there's also a lot of diagnostic information that I, I can talk about when we get up there. I'll just run through a few of our coastal systems. These are now systems that we've got around the United States. Um, this one's in New Hampshire in the Gulf of Maine. It's showing us, so the water CO2 is actually increasing there. So it's switched from a sink to a source over the past month. Uh, now we are going to Mississippi. So this is a system we've got off of Biloxi, Mississippi. And here the CO2. So before you saw Maine was uh, increasing and it was now a source. Mississippi, uh, northern Gulf of Mexico is uh, still uh, lower than atmospheric. And then the third one, I think, is uh, off the Washington coast. This is now uh, off of Aberdeen, Washington, near Seattle. And we, we, we see this is a, a typical plot for that particular region. It's extremely variable. Um, there's a very narrow shelf there. We get a lot of upwelling signals. There's a lot of, uh, and this time of year when storms come through, we get a lot of mixing. So um, you get a lot, of, a lot more variability there than you see in other places, but it's still a pretty substantial sink. So notice the, the magnitude of the changes here too, right? So atmosphere right now is, is uh, 380 and change, and we're getting values that are down in the 200s. Um, and then I think I just want to show you one more that's, we've got three systems now that are on, that are located right next to coral reefs, within five meters of the coral reefs. So we've got one in La Paguera, Puerto Rico, one in Kaneohe Bay, Hawaii, which I'm showing you here, and one in uh, Heron Island on the Great Barrier Reef. And this is just an example of, of the kinds of signals that we see. We see a similar thing in Puerto Rico. And so now look, now look at the scale. So here's the air and here's the water. We have to get this incredible diurnal variability, but look at the scale. We're going from 400 up to 8, 900 ppm in a, in a daily cycle. <laughs> and this, this we think is just a, a, a oscillation between respiration signals and calcification and productivity um, during the day. Productivity seems to draw the CO2 down, and then uh, at night, the respiration and calcification seems to uh, drive it back up. Yeah? I do. I have one. Um, let's see. I don't know whether I can show. We have one, for example. Uh, I won't try and find it. I have one in uh, Puget Sound, actually in the in Tuano, in the lower end of Hood Canal, and uh, there again we see huge signals. It's it's extremely variable. So uh, this I think relates back to the discussion that we had um, that was going on this morning about you know relating <laughs> your experiments to the conditions that you're seeing in situ. Perhaps this is an area where you've got uh, longer residence times, but uh, you know there's you, you need to be at least aware of the conditions on if if you're interested in studying this reef. If you take them out of this environment and put them into a constant 380, or you know if you're going to call that your modern current conditions. That's very different at a steady, if you're maintaining it constantly at 380, that's very different than where they just came from. So I think you need to be, that's, I think there's a lot of advantage to 
knowing the conditions and monitoring those conditions um, that you're trying to reproduce, either with a mooring or monitoring the water as it's coming in, yeah. When I calibrate? Right, so it's what you're doing is you're calibrating the, uh, to the temperature of the gases that you're measuring. So it's, it's uh, basically the air temperature. Yes, it could be, but the equilibration, since the equilibrator is sitting in the water, the equilibration actually occurs at seawater temperature, whatever it is, because it's sitting in the seawater. But the, the temperature of the gas, by the time it gets to the LICOR, uh, is, is the temperature of the air and of the other, yeah, so. And we do, we do measure that temperature in the LICOR and it does correct for small differences in that but we don't feel that there's a correction back to seawater temperature because the equilibration actually occurred at, in the seawater, so it doesn't really matter what the temperature is. We do measure it. We also, this system uh, has interfaces so that you can uh, plug in a microcat to measure the temperature and salinity. A actually, now it also can take a Seabird 16, which has a number of auxiliary ports so you can plug in an oxygen optode and a transmissometer and a fluorometer or whatever you want, and all of that data will also get put into the MAPCO2 system and be transmitted back in real time so that you can see those values. We also now have also uh, modified the software so if you get a, if you have a SAMI pH sensor, which is the only other commercially available carbon parameter aside from CO2 is pH, even though that's the worst pair to do, it's all we can do right now. Um, so you can actually plug the SAMI directly into our system and get the real-time pH data back and at least see whether the SAMI is working properly or not. Um, so just to finish up, we need to go upstairs and take a look at the actual system and I'll kind of show you how it works and. Um, stuff, but I just wanted to kind of throw up, this is the current, as of last night, um, developing map of the national, what, what we're anticipating will be the national plans for the ocean acidification monitoring network. So the, you're hopefully all familiar with the 4AM Act, the... Uh, federal Ocean Acidification Research and Monitoring Act. Thank you. The Federal Ocean Acidification Research and Monitoring Act. 4AM with an extra A in, in it, but uh, uh, part of that is a monitoring program, and so this, this is not official yet, it's still very much uh, being developed, but there we in kind of envision three components to that. One would be a, a global uh, open ocean monitoring effort, which are shown with these blue stars, and again these these sites may move around, but at the moment, um, this is kind of what we're thinking for that global monitoring network. There's a, uh, a coastal component for the United States, which are these pink symbols here. So we're talking about having monitoring sites all around the United States in various sites. And then there's these green, ugly green diamonds, our uh, coral reef monitoring sites. So you kind of get a sense of the magnitude of what we're looking for over the next five or ten years to try and develop as part of this. And uh, our hope is that these uh, CO2 systems that you're going to see today will be a significant part of this, at least for the surface ocean. All right? Yeah, so, um, yeah. Uh, I couldn't see. Yeah, apparently, apparently it's gone. Well, so I, 
let, I, I should back up a little bit. There, there are actually, there are two, there, there are multiple plans, but within NOAA and within the United States, there are actually at least two plans. Um, this all started off as an effort to monitor air-sea gas exchange. So uh, most of the moorings that, I sh that you saw in the previous figures that I mentioned, there are 21 of them out now, those are all moorings aimed at understanding air-sea gas exchange. For that plan, I actually have a map with 60 sites that I hope to fulfill to monitor gas exchange, and that does have a, a mooring in the Mediterranean. Um, these are specifically what we're calling ocean acidification moorings, which in the terms of the open ocean, uh, in most cases, or hopefully all cases, overlap with the air-sea gas exchange, but they've been enhanced with additional measurements, right? To, to understand ocean acidification, you have to monitor at least two carbon parameters. So these would be specific sites where we're not only doing PCO2, but we're also doing another carbon parameter and also hopefully some biological measurements with it. <laughs> so at, at best the available. best available at the moment, the only other one we have is is the SAMI pH system. That's not our preferred pr pair. Um, so there are a number of people, including myself, that are trying to develop uh, other parameters. But again, think back to what's involved in doing some of those other measurements. So I'm, for example, working on a moored DIC system that's more or less modeled after the infrared uh, DIC system that you guys saw here. Just um, you acidify a water sample, and then once it's acidified and stripped, then basically it's, it's the same thing that the system does already in measuring CO2, but it's not quite that simple. But So for now, it's going to be pH, but we hope to uh, get something else going. Yes? Can you say anything about the estimated annual cost of maintenance? <laughs> so the, if you... What we've, you know, over the last year, I used to build these, so I've, I've built uh, 36 of these systems myself, or, you know, our lab has. My people. My people. <coughs> um, but oh, what we realized that as, as all of this is developing, that we're not a manufacturing facility. So over the last year, We've transferred this technology to a company, Battelle, and when we go upstairs, I've got brochures that anyone that's interested are, is welcome to take those. So Battelle is now manufacturing them commercially. In fact, um, this year I bought 12 systems from them, and they, they seem to be very good. They're modeled exactly after uh, my systems. If you contact Battelle, depending on how many you buy, but assuming you buy one, they cost... Uh, 39,000. The quote was 39,200. 39,200. Well, that didn't seem to include batteries or the calibration gas. Uh, are you sure? I think it does. It's supposed... I sent them an email to inquire. Please. Okay, yeah. The, I was told that they were going to sell them for 38,000 for everything, including the batteries, the calibrated gas. And that calibrated gas cost me $1,000 a tank alone. All the satellite transmission components... The SIM card's free, actually. <laughs> um, so, uh, but uh, we'll go with the assumption now. I, th I think those systems come complete for that price. I, I de definitely let me know if not. Uh, no, that's just the CO2 system. The, the three boxes. That's, yeah, the three parts. That will run, that's designed to run nominally for 400 days doing samples about every three hours. Um, how long the, s the systems will run, so at the end of that time, at the very least you have to change the calibration gas and the battery. So the batteries cost, it would cost you uh, 
you know, $1,200 plus whatever your ship time is to go out and, and replace them. I personally have two systems for every site, so I swap because I don't want to have any sort of break. So I just put in a new one and take out the old one. And then we do, we, we swap out valves and, and um, for all that I do for maintaining these things for, you know, multiple, multiple years is probably on the order of $10,000 a year, I'd say, for a site. Uh, this picture will be filled out yes, this well. picture should be filled out with the other national plans. I mean, I could maybe pull up Dick's, but I think it's all changed even yeah. since then. So I'm sorry, I didn't prepare that. I don't have that slide. Do you have it handy? Chris, um, just to help people understand this, you see here an instrument that went from an early development in one laboratory to scaling up to how you would use a lot of copies of those kind of instruments, modified to make it easier to copy and more appropriate, to finally transitioning to a commercial instrument. How many dollars had to go in before anybody could buy one? So the way this the way this happened <coughs> was uh, we, we wrote a proposal to NOAA together with Imbari to do the original transfer from Imbari to, to PMEL. That was a three-year grant, roughly $200,000 a year for them to give us the system. It included measurement. It's, it's complicated because there's deployed systems mixed in there. <laughs> okay, so then once that transition was done, we basically went and re-engineered because most systems that are built by researchers, you know, are basically held together with duct tape and chewing gum and, and you know, if you, you have to do this and then you do this and, you know, <laughs> uh, right. I mean, so Kim, how long does it take to train someone to do, you know, it takes a bit of training. But what I'm doing is, in, in my ultimate plan, if I get, if I have 60 moorings out in the water doing uh, for the global atmospheric CO2 monitoring network, you know, and another 20 moorings along the coast that are doing coastal work, and another 28 at the moment coral reef, that's a lot of more. I can't be, I can't do all of that. I can't be working with, with, you know, everyone to train them how to do it. So we've basically put a great deal of time and effort into making these things scientist-proof, which is worse than idiot-proof. <laughs> <coughs> so, uh, I, and I can't really tell you. Million? So, I, it, huh? One to two million. Yeah, I would say one to two million, probably, heavily subsidized by the federal government. And, and, then, and then Battelle took it over, and the Battelle transfer, um, they're telling me that they have so far put into this about $2 million as well, into taking what we had as, now we had done all, we had all the mechanical draw, all the CAD drawings of every single component. We had tolerances on everything. See, these are things that scientists don't do. You know, when you want to build that air block, you know, there are very tight tolerances on how you do those. If you're going to build one, yeah, you, you know, you build it and you fix it. And when you're building 50 of them, you can't do that. <laughs> but ours was still just for in-house use. There's a whole nother step when you take it to a commercial production that uh, requires more development. So yes, this is many millions of dollars to ultimately get to this. My point here was as you hope for better and easier instruments, recognize
recognize one of the reasons it's not yet happening. That, that's, uh, well, so the, the way that we decided the stations at this point was a combination of trying to get some sort of reasonable distribution into areas, different areas where we knew that there are likely to be interesting signals. You know, we, we have the Takahashi map of where CO2 is coming out of the ocean, going into the ocean. We have those maps of the buffer capacity to, you know, an idea of the kinds of regions we want to monitor. Then you got to go back and say, well, are there any platforms in that area? Because I don't typically do buoys. I'm putting my system on someone else's buoy because it's, it's uh, you know, $10,000 to maintain a system, you know, $50,000 to get started, $10,000 a year to maintain just the electronics, not to mention the people I have to pay to monitor the data and deal with all the buoy people, <coughs> but um, that's just for the CO2. If I had to do the moorings as well, then it would be millions of dollars a site, <laughs> you know, to do all of that. So I go, so it was partially where, where are they available, where are they people that I can work with that, um, you know, for example, these three sites are uh, sites that uh, NOAA, that Mike McFadden, in down the hall from me is planning, is putting in the equatorial uh, in Indian Ocean and I can walk down the hall and say, hey Mike, can I put a system on your buoy? And he goes, oh sure. And he ships out of PMEL and so it's, it's a little bit convenience but also looking at the distribution. Oops. Oh, we don't need this upstairs. <laughs> 